Hello, welcome back to Al Nahudi Central. Uh, I hope everybody had a good Christmas and a, uh, an even better New Year. And this episode is all about bus wires. So here laid out on the desk is essentially everything you need, <clears throat> not only for uh, laying a DCC uh, setup, but also an analog setup. And I'll go through each piece of kit individually to tell you what they are. Uh, but essentially this video is going to be a quick intro into uh, the different types of uh, wiring system you can have for your model railway and also uh, what I'm opting for. So the question we have to ask is what are the different types of wiring system for model railways? So basically you have an analog system or DC uh, as it can be called uh, which utilizes something like this which is a this is a simple analog controller or you can have a DCC system and this is the uh, the bog standard Hornby Select which is a DCC controller now there are others on the market <coughs> which I will uh, hopefully get to buy uh, but at the moment I'm just using a uh, Hornby Select so DCC what does it stand for it stands for Digital Command Control. Now my layout will be DCC. However, I will explain the basic principles of each uh, in layman's terms. Uh, but if you do want a more thorough understanding of the subjects, there are plenty of more comprehensive videos out there on YouTube. <coughs> or alternatively, you can visit uh, Brian Lambert's webpage, uh, which I'll put a link up uh, somewhere on the screen or in the comments down below. Brian Lambert's website is a must go to uh, for any railway modeler. Uh, not only does it explain everything, it also puts things into pictures. And as they say, a picture paints a thousand words. Anyhow, analog layouts. These work by putting a direct current rated at around 12 volts uh, into the track, and that's done so through an analog transformer, something like this. Now, this is uh, something from my childhood it's a, a Lima a Transec. Uh, transformer and what you would do with this is from the two terminals you'd run two cables into the track and then you power the track uh, they can range from basic analog controllers like this one or you can get uh, multi uh, analog controllers uh, now if there is a single loop you'd only be able to control one train on that loop. You could separate the loop uh, having isolated sections uh, and it is possible then to run a second train hence why you'd have multiple controllers. Uh, with DC current uh, you increase or decrease the amount of power you put into the track which would then in turn increase or decrease the speed of the loco. The wiring setup for this type of system is complex and there are multiple wires running under the baseboard all over the place and quite frankly it looks like a van delivering spaghetti has overturned, spilt its load, spilling all the spaghetti over the road, and that road happens to be Spaghetti Junction. Hence, with the introduction of DCC, uh, a lot of people uh, have chosen this newer system to operate their layouts, uh, and that's why I'm using that layout. Uh, using that, sorry, <laughs> using that system. With DCC, you can control individual locos on the track, as each loco has a unique DCC decoder in it. And multiple locos can run at the same time without the need for isolated sections. With it being digital, this also encompasses newer technologies such as individual loco lighting, smoke and sound. And it's easy to do, and this is why I have chosen to opt for this setup. Now the easiest and the most popular method of creating a DCC system is by installing a bus wire. 
Now a bus wire is a set of two wires, one positive and one negative, which will run the entire route of your layout, anywhere essentially where the rails go. So in my case, a bus wire will encompass the whole layout. So there'll be two sets of wires, one positive, one negative, circling the whole layout. So the bus wire is usually a thicker wire, and for this, I'm using this. Uh, this is a uh, obviously the positive wire. It's from Rapid Electronics, and this is a 100 meter reel. It's a 32 slash 0.2 wire, which means there are 32 strands within this cable of 0.2 diameter. Uh, it's always better to try and use multi-core rather than a solid core uh, because it, it, it's better for con uh, conductivity. Now I've got two reels, I've got a black reel and a red reel, obviously positive, negative, and they will run side by side all the way around the uh, layout. Uh, this has been purchased from Rapid Electronics as I said, uh, uh, and I was recommended by them really uh, through uh, Everard Junction's uh, video uh, where he explained what he was using. I've chosen uh, red and black obviously, red for positive and black for negative, uh, as that way I can be sure I'm connecting up to the right cables, to the rails and to the right rails all the time. Because if you mix up one, you'll get a short in the system and your trains won't run. Now this cable uh, will be lined the whole layout, as I said. Though some of you say uh, that maybe you should twist the cables together, uh, as there'll be better con uh, connectivity or conductivity. Uh, but if I were to do that, I wouldn't be able to connect the, uh, the splices, which are these things, which again are from Rapid Electronics. Uh, onto the actual bus wire, which takes me on to what we call things called dropper wires. Now dropper wires are these things here. Now these are 16 0.2. So if you remember the uh, bus wire has 32 strands of 0.2. This smaller wire only has 16 in it. And these dropper wires uh, will be connected to the main bus wire using the splices and then connected onto the track. So once you've decided which rail will be positive and which rail will be negative, you have to stick to it. For example, looking at the rails from the top, if you decide the left hand rail, so this one here, is going to be the positive, then you must follow that rule for the whole layout. If you swap or solder the negative cable by mistake, Later on in the layout, this will cause a short and nothing will work. So essentially, the red white cables will be connected to the left hand throughout and the black will be connected to the right hand throughout. If you happen to accidentally solder the wrong one, the locos aren't going to run. By drilling a small hole in the baseboard where you want the dropper wire to poke up through, the best way by far of connecting these cables to the rails is by soldering. Again, there are different methods of soldering the cables. Some people opt for soldering the cable to the underneath of the fish plate like so. But the disadvantage of this is that it relies then on the fish plate connecting with the rails and if there's any movement due to heat or expansion in, in the rails, wherever your layout is situated, then the connectivity may be reduced. Uh, the next two options are then soldering directly to the side of the rail or soldering directly to the bottom of the rail. Now I haven't decided which method I'm going to do because I can see pros and cons with both methods. By far it would be simpler to solder the dropper cable to the side of the rail uh, once the rails have been pinned down onto the baseboard. Hopefully with some good ballasting skills you would be able to cover up the solder join and the cable uh, but there might be the odd location where the dropper cable may be visible 
if you look closely, I have soldered uh, the wires or the cables to the side of my programming track, uh, which are here. So with soldering the dropper wires to the underside of the rail, uh, this can't be done uh, after you've laid this section of the track down onto the baseboard. So you'd have to do this prior to actually laying it. This would be easier to conceal uh, because obviously it wouldn't be on the side, but you then have the hassle of having to pre-solder the rails with the dropper wires to then attach to the bus wire underneath. Uh, once I've come up to a decision, I'll let you know. And if you yourselves have any preferences, please let me know in the comments below. So now it comes to how to attach the actual dropper cables to the main bus wire. Again, there are a number of ways to do this. One way is to strip down the cable, the actual cable sheathings to expose the bare wire underneath. Once, that, uh, once the wire is visible, you can then solder directly onto this bare wire uh, with the dropper wire and then run that up to the rails above. You would then have to insulate the cable, obviously, so that there wasn't any bare wire exposed. Another method is to use what we call connector strips. These things here. Now you can get different uh, rated amps. I think these are uh, five amp. They're easy to use. They're also commonly known as terminal strips or chop blocks. These work by inserting one end of the bus, of a bus wire, which is cut and screwing down uh, to make the connection with the screw. Uh, and then on the other end, you can insert uh, the other section of the bus wire that continues on and also into the same hole connecting the dropper cable so that a connection is made not only between the two bus wires, but also with the strip section of the dropper cable, which then feeds the track. Another option is using these things. Uh, now these are called the splices. Uh, and again, these were from Rapid, uh, Rapid Electronics. Uh, these are used in the motor engineering trade and work well applied into the application of model railways. If you look at some of the bigger YouTube channels like Everard Junction, Dean Park Station, and New Junction, uh, they all have these videos on the wiring and this is what they use. Uh, there are some people who will say that the connections fail and don't make uh, a proper connection with the cables, but I think that this is the option I am going to choose. A must-have tool for this is a pair of wire strippers. Now, there are several on the market, but I can't recommend these highly enough. They're easy to use, not too expensive, and gauge the size of cable you insert into its teeth so that you only strip the cable and not the wires inside. Well, if you need to strip a small section on all the ends of the cables in order to join them together, to make that electrical connection. Now there's a another uh, type of uh, cable stripper, wire stripper, uh, which you might see in the market. But I would always choose my Draper wire cutters. They strip and they cut and they're just great. The general rule for installation is to have a dropper wire or cable, whichever way, uh, one you want to call it, on every section of track. So that if you're installing flexi track, for example, a dropper uh, wire would be advantageous on each section so that the track has power throughout as it is generally accepted that the further the track away from the transformer the less power there is to the track and by soldering each section this means that the track has continuous power and roughly equally uh, same supply around its entirety. Now there are different ways of thinking uh, throughout the hobby about whether you should have a continuous circuit or to have breaks in the circuit or just have a straight bus wire uh, which terminates at one end. Uh, that is the proposed option I'm going to go for and what I'll do is place a pair of these terminal strips uh, to make sure that no, uh, none of the wires touch each other at the end resulting in a short. So what else uh, would one need uh, or which is helpful to, to installing either an analog or a DCC uh, setup? Always have insulation tape. Obviously, again, red and black, uh, just a freeze of uh, sight. Insulation tape can uh, patch up work that you've made a mistake on or connect wires together. Uh, and it, it's basically what it says, insulation. It insulates the cable uh, to stop it from touching anything else. Also handy to have is a, a multimeter. Now these can be picked up quite cheaply. They're roughly around 10 pounds and it shows you that you have got current going through your track. Now you can change from voltage to amps to, to anything. Uh, and this is a must have. Obviously these are the uh, terminal blocks, chop blocks I was talking about. Uh, these are the 15 amp ones. These are the five amp ones. And you can split these up. So 
that it goes in one end and out the other. <clears throat> this is a fiberglass pencil. Now, uh, when soldering to the track, it's all right if you're soldering onto new track, which isn't dirty or anything like that. But if you're soldering onto old track, uh, a fiberglass pencil will get the side of the rail nice and clean. And it will then give a nice contact surface for the solder. Soldering iron. Now, this is a 30 watt. I think this was from either Lidl or Aldi uh, here in the UK. Uh, the higher the watt, uh, the hotter the soldering iron uh, will go. 30 watt is quite capable of reaching the desired temperature that I want. Uh, so that is what I will be using. What you'll need is uh, solder and flux. Now flux is pasted onto the uh, onto the bare metal surface prior to actually uh, soldering. The flux acts as a conductor and it allows the uh, solder to flow more easily. And that essentially is it. If you've got any questions or any comments, please put them in the, uh, in the comments below. I'll be back soon with some more videos. Ciao for now.